Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 96, recorded March 27th, 2013. Andy Inotko. It's time for Triangulation. I love this show. A chance for me to sit down and spend an hour with some of the best minds, most interesting thinkers, the people who are really changing the world and have such interesting ideas. And I'm so excited. It's funny because I've known this guy for a long time to get our guest on this week, Andy Inotko. And you certainly know his name. He's one of the great Macintosh uh, journalists out there. He's written for the Chicago, continues to write for the Chicago Sun-Times as their tech editor there. He's our uh, host on Mac Break Weekly. He does some other podcasts on his own, including uh, Andy's Almanac on uh, the 5 by 5 network. Andy, welcome to Triangulation. It's nice to see you at a respectable hour of six or seven in the evening. You're get, <laughs> getting, getting me up at one in the afternoon, you know, on the East Coast for Mac break. That's it's kind of a hassle. I am. You know, it's funny because I feel like I, I've know, I know you so well. We worked together for five or six years now. And I remember the first time I met you running into you at a Mac World, I think it was. And you, I couldn't miss you because I saw the hat and the sideburns. <laughs> and that's your trademark. <laughs> Which did you see first? <laughs> it was all of a piece. You were going up an escalator, and I said, "Hey, Andy Anatko." <laughs> I did. I I was so excited to uh, to meet you because I'd read you for years. When did you? Uh, what What's the story? What's the genesis of Andy Anatko, journalist? When did you start writing? Was it in college? Uh, yeah, but like like my first year in college, uh, I started writing for uh, my local user group, the Boston Computer Society Mac group. Uh, and that would sort of been the equivalent of like having having a Tumblr blog where all you have to do is write and they will print it in there with what used to be a thick, glossy uh, uh, user group magazine because we were supported by like actual annual memberships. Uh, but it was a great time, to, a, a great opportunity to like learn how to write because really as a vo all volunteer effort, you were looking for, they, they were all just looking for people who could write uh, on deadline and about the meetings and stuff. So that was a, that was a, a great training ground. Uh, and then I also was helping to run the meetings uh, every single month. Uh, there, I used to do this thing uh, because oftentimes I think you remember what it was like, like in the late 80s, early 90s or whatever, where you'd have this overhead projector that would plug into this, you know, the classic Macintosh with this, some sort of kludged up thing to get the video uh, out of there. And it was always breaking down or something. It was, and it was, it was like <laughs> pre Mac OS 10. So the Macs were always crashing and freezing up during a demonstration. And so we always needed to have something standing by so that we could cover like the 10 or 15 minutes of like hurried diagnostics that were happening you know, to get the get the demonstration or the, the 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 tutorial running again so what i used to do is that i used to have this is, go, this is going somewhere i promise you uh I, I used to like leave my my return of the jedi lunchbox like at the entrance <laughs> to like the auditorium and i have like a stack of index cards and a bunch of golf pencils and as people are coming in if they have a question like a technical question like a genius bar type question write it down on the card drop it in there uh and then you know during these down times i would just you know reach into this lunchbox, grab a question, and start answering stuff. And sometimes I knew what the answer was off the top of my head. Sometimes I would start off a discussion, but it was a real think on your feet sort of gesture. And it also came in handy because there was one meeting in which the editors in chief of Mac World, Mac User, uh, and Mac Week were our guests for that day. Uh, and so I wound up, we, ha we had a really bad time with the hardware. And so I was up there for a good like 20 or 30 minutes just answering questions. Um, and I was also pulling, pulling a, I, I have to say that I kind of inflated my own knowledge a bit because uh, I was pulling off an old mentalist trick where you have like a sealed envelopes and you're holding up to your forehead and trying to guess like what's inside this envelope or I'm guessing that you've written down your malady. I see a woman called <laughs> Emma and she's having a problem with her ankle and you rip open and then of course there is this woman called Emma. Oh my God, you didn't, you got that just without even opening the envelope. Unbeknownst to anybody, you actually have been opening these envelopes and you're actually answering the response that you got one envelope beforehand. So that would give me like an extra three oh, minutes. Oh, that's to think clever. About 
Yeah. So actually, instead of like, you know, I, I think that it might be like you might it might be a, a an intermittent tr a termination problem on your SCSI bus because if you if you have really if it really is an, an, an original Mac two. So there's, there's, I was having some fun at, at the at people's expense. That's clever. Uh, I gotta steal the, that idea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's I, I, I've I've used that a couple times where in case you you need to look a little bit more more insightful than you actually are. Uh, anyway, so. Uh, there was a it was a combination of like kismet and good planning. Uh, I I was hoping that I'd have an opportunity to like press some of my uh, user group writings into the editor's hands. So I had like you know Manila. I was so proud that for real like real professional, I put them in Manila envelopes and everything, <laughs> and made sure that I had multiple copies. Uh, and there you know after afterwards, I was known as the oh you're the guy who was answering those questions. You know have, have, you know, have you got, have you ever considered writing for whatever? I said, well, I, as I, a matter I, of well, fact, sir, I sometimes had, <laughs> and it was cool. Like, so I got so Mac user like had me write a sample thing, and three months later, I had a column. It was wonderful. Wow. Wow. Yeah, remember the BCS was a great... There were two great Macintosh users groups. I was a member of the West Coast, the BMUG, Berkeley yep. Macintosh users group, and BCS in Boston. Did they, did they do the same thing that BMUG did? BMUG would only put out its newsletter once a year, but it was like a phone book. No, no, we had... Uh, had monthly? We had... Yeah, the Boston Peer Society Mac Group had a, a monthly mag, a monthly newsletter, and it was about the size of what would have been a, a, a regular monthly periodical around that time. So maybe about a quarter inch thick, on full of like columns that have been written by the subgroup members and stuff like that. Um, the BCS, remember the Mac Group was part of. I think that at some point there were about seven dozen different groups for every single special interest group out there. So right. it just with Mac people alone, there were something like nine special interest groups, including the developers, the, the desktop publishers, uh, the newbies, that sort of stuff. So there was never any shortage of content coming in from people. You were a computer geek in high school? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was the annoying kind of computer geek <laughs> uh, because... Uh, it was it was it was cool because we we had an Apple II uh, Apple II Plus or IIe at the house, uh, and so every all my spare time was spent either coding or word processing, writing some stuff. Uh, and so, unfortunately for my computer teachers, I had already go gone not only past basic language, not only pa past Pascal, but now I was writing machine code, uh, and I had in the interests of. Shall we say understanding more about how commercial games uh -oh. are protected against theft and illegal <laughs> redistribution? Uh -oh. I had learned a lot about how, what makes disk drives work, and uh -huh. so uh, as part of that, I had, to re I had to write a whole new operating system to get things things to work. As so as a result, I could make these computers do things that uh, the teacher did not even know was actually possible. Because again, uh, remember th remember that this was the olden days when you bought a computer and they would and Apple would say. Sure, here's a complete disassembly of all of the ROM codes inside right. there. So if you right. want to replace that with anything you want, go right ahead. Those times have changed. Yeah. So you were, it's interesting. So you were hacking, in those days, the games most often used defects in the disks, right? And they would uh, look for, they would try to read a disk sector, a known disk sector. And if they came back normal, they'd go, yeah, you made a copy. But if it came back, can't read this, it's pirated. Were you cracking that? There, there were so many clever things that were being done there because every every single time it would boot up, it would have to start off with a specific track of a specific sector. After that, all bets were off, depending right. on how clever they would get. I remember that I think there was a, I think the name of the software was uh, was Dazzle Draw. Uh, and Dazzle Draw, I was, yeah, exactly. And so, uh, and so, it's it, I've, I've almost became like Radar O'Reilly. <laughs> where I would I would I would I would put my hand on top of the disk drive I and I could just feel how the stepper what the stepper motor was wow. doing, and at some point I would like take the cover off so I could watch to see what the stepper motor was doing and knowing that no wow it's going to places that it's not supposed to be going to. Wow. Dazzle Draw was I when I finished that crack I kind of stood up and applauded the makers of this because they had done s intersecting spiraling tracks instead of being concentric they were laid out in spirals so that it would be really really difficult for someone to like follow the movement of the of the data being loaded in and shove that off someplace else and so i'm like oh man i almost <laughs> don't want to do i i almost want uh, if grant granted that if if you were paying me by the hour for how much time i was spending on trying to copy this disc i would probably be making three hundred dollars <laughs> instead of the forty dollars this, this game would have cost but you, you learn a lot it's a lot of fun and you're like I bet you, you wish that the, you wish you could meet the person who who came up with this copy protection scheme because man, it was clever and it taught you a whole lot about what was possible. It did. It became a lot less about piracy and much, much more about just hacking.
having fun. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's, that's why I always have a certain amount of respect for uh, white hat hackers because uh, in the uh, most people when they hear about someone who is doing the digital equivalent of twisting doorknobs and trying to pick locks and trying to see how good a combination lock is, they see someone who was trying to get at your credit card information or trying to do no good stuff. When I really am part, I, I, as a kid, I remember that tradition of, I wonder how this works yeah. and I wonder how well protected this thing is. And I wonder what I could learn about what makes this system actually work. Uh, and so, and, and once you get to it, really playing the game or, uh, or using the utility wasn't really uh, the fun. The fun was actually unraveling that mystery. It was like the, it was like the babble fish all over again. I wonder where kids are doing that today. Things are so complex that I doubt, I mean, I think about uh, DVD John who was just a high school student when he cracked the code that was used to protect DVD movies and wrote DCSS. Um, but nowadays, I mean, if you were going to try to crack Blu-ray, forget it. I wonder what the kids today are doing uh, as their way of learning and exploring and perhaps, you know, mm. being a little bad. I'm, 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 really, I'm really quite jealous because uh, they, don't, they don't get access. They, they don't, Apple will not sell, uh, send them the source code to all of their products. To, uh, like they right. would send us the source code to the Apple too. But uh, they have Xcode. Not only that, but they have in the internet and a community of developers, yeah. right? Exactly, who, who will help them and teach them uh, how to write apps. And I mean, I still remember when I was I was eight, seventeen, or eighteen, and I was teaching at a summer computer camp for adults, where again, run by the Boston Computer Society, where if you if you had a, a staff member who needed like a week worth of training on PageMaker or whatever, we basically rented a community college for a, a junior college for a month during the summer when they were shut down, use the dorms, use the classrooms, mm -hmm. uh, and but they would also use another like child's computer camp, not from the BCS, was also using the same property. And the, I remember a summer day when I'm going back from teaching a class and I see this kid walking across, happy as can be, holding like a, an object, a, a C++ training manual. And I'm like, that kid is learning how to shut objective <laughs> programming. And I still can't really understand objective <laughs> programming because, oh man, I better learn how to like make, make butter or farm or something because I can, I'm never going to catch up to this 10 year old kid. What was your first computer? Was it a Mac? No, I didn't get a. I, I couldn't afford a Mac for a long, long time. Uh, the family computer was an Apple II Plus, I think, um, which I had from but, like junior but, high. But Macs were out. You just you were still on an older computer. Yeah, well, when I, well, that was when I was in high school, uh, and no, I was not going to ask my parents. Hi, can you buy me a twenty five hundred dollar computer? <laughs> uh, there, there was there was a kid in my school who. I have to guess in retrospect that their parents were going through a messy divorce and trying to carry his favor yeah. with expensive. He was like the, he Guilt had like gift. the Ferris Bueller bedroom. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but my, my really, it was, uh, unfortunately, uh, I had to, uh, the, my, my first computer that I bought myself was a, a PC clone because mm -hmm. I could, I could afford $410. Right. Uh, my, my first Mac was actually a Mac 512, which was at, even at that point, a couple years old. And I was only able to afford that because I was working in the computer department of a department store that had a very liberal pro policy on uh, on discounting stuff that was uh, no longer on the price list. Uh, and so by sort of manipulating the innards to make sure it would never work properly when someone tried to fire it up, I was able to get it to stay there on the shelf for about a month and a half, <laughs> at which point I was able to offer them like 90 bucks for it. And they, and they took it because, oh, well, it's a piece of junk. It doesn't really work. And then I would, of course, take it home and then, you know, reconnect the flyback transformer, put, put back in. <laughs> yeah, it works. It was, it's alive. It was paralegal, but I, I needed a Mac. Did you did you uh, want to be a programmer? Was that what you thought you would end up doing? Yeah. I mean, I went to school for computer science. I thought that. Oh, I didn't know that. You're actually yeah, trained I mean, in this. Uh, ex exactly. I, I've, I've built I've, I've built Turing machines back when you needed uh, to make those out of Legos and, uh, and gear ratios. Uh, well, not maybe not quite, but yes. Uh, yeah, I, I did think that uh, I would either be a, a programmer developer and be writing like f uh, fiction for fun on the side. Uh, I was very pleased that I could make writing like my primary uh, my primary role because uh, computers are very, very curt and nasty but if you don't format things exactly the way they want they will simply dig in their heels and not do your bidding whereas the english language is very very flexible and very very fluid it's they're, 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 they almost never do a syntax check or at least if you confuse your editor enough he'll just say uh whatever we'll publish it am i still off oh there i am okay we're working on the mics back here um so uh where did you go to college i didn't know you were studying computer science uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic up in upstate New York. Yeah, great school 
for computer yeah. scientists. Yeah, it actually, was, it was more for engineering than for science, but that was kind of cool for me because it was kind of like going to a very small school where you could really twist doorknobs and get access to pretty much anything you wanted if, in the computer science uh, program. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I still remember the first time I saw a Mac 2, it was just for, it was like one in the morning. I was simply walking through campus, seeing what doors were open. And I see this lab of graduate students who are working on like graphics algorithms and this buffet table that simply had naked boards <laughs> on it that I was told was a Mac 2 uh, prototype that had been lent to them by Apple because they were trying to figure out how to make a driver work or something. Uh, and so wow. uh, it's, I, I think, I, I don't know if that was the culture at other colleges, but uh, it was that my, my, I think they learned the most at college when, again, one or two in the morning, I'm walking along, seeing what doors are open, walking in and just being the biggest dumb guy ever yeah. and saying, Hello, I'm I'm not a, I'm not here to challenge any of you, any of your knowledge or your budget. I'm just here so you can pat yourself on the back that you know so much more than a stupid freshman. Got anything you want soldered? <laughs> RPI, a great school, and and uh, so you were in college doing that, and then driving to Boston for the BCS meetings. No, no, I had to, I had to take a I had to take a year or so off. Oh, okay. Uh, and, and by the time I took a year or so off, it was like, okay, I'm making enough money. I did the same now. thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, real life and binged. It was, it was, it was a, it was a double thing because I was actually paying. I, I was actually paying as I go. Uh, I, I had I had a lot of scholarships, uh, so a lot of help there. And unfor unfortunately, or unfortunately, my tuition bill was low enough that if I worked really, really hard over the summer, I could actually pay for most of it and take out a very low student loan. Uh, and there was a point which a I was having a problem with physics. It was the only class that I was just not getting it, or I was I was more interested in learning Unix than in learning <laughs> learning physics. Uh, so a combination of that and okay, I got I got to take a year off to make some more money back so I can you know afford to go back to school and. Again, that sort of interrupted things. So, do you have a novel in the uh, desk drawer? Yeah, I have a couple. Um, really? It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's well, it's uh, it's uh, it's funny. I, I it's I was maybe it's because of the way that the generation I grew up in, where uh, I'm not used to. If if I were if I were born like 20 years later, I might be thinking. Uh, if I if I was born during the era of blogs and uh, or grew up in the era of blogs and uh, and Twitter, I might grow up thinking, well, I don't care if this is not very good. I'm just going to put it out there and let people take a look at it. Uh, I've, I've written a couple that were like the first one was just stream of consciousness only <laughs> only only worse. So, uh, <laughs> but but it, but it got me into the habit of okay, here's what it's like to type right. you know, 60, 70, 80, 80,000 words and say, hey, I'm done. Right. Uh, but I read it. I read it like three months later, and I realized that okay, this was a learning exercise. Uh, then a couple years later, I finished. Uh, uh, rather, excuse me, like five years ago, I finished a second one that was like okay, I'm tr I can see where I was going with that. That's still very good. I think that rather than fix this, I'm going to keep you know, hold on to that one too and apply what I learned to something else. Uh, and so now I'm actually working on two pieces of long fiction kind of concurrently that I think are going to be the first things that I actually try to publish. I didn't know this about you. That's cool. Is it's, it's, it's fun when you don't have any expectation that you're going to actually show this to anybody if you're right. just writing fun. So that's you do it because you love it. Yeah, and it's it's. I feel like I've I've seen novels that have been written by people who are not noted for being novelists, uh, and I'm, I, I promise you, I'm not thinking of anyone specifically right now. But where it's like he's a he's a very very famous artist, and he got a contract to write a novel, and you can see that oh, this is very much a first novel, yeah. and maybe he should have waited until he had something good to show. So this the thing I'm working on right now. It's, I feel like it's I feel like it's original. I feel like it's it's interesting more than anything else. I'm having fun writing it. Uh, and so that's what that's why that's going to be the first thing that I might put out there. Is it a genre of fiction? Is it a sci-fi or? No, it's very. It's I, I guarantee you, you'll be very very surprised when you see the. It's a sex novel. novel. <laughs> I said surprise. <laughs> uh, no, it's 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 interesting. Uh, what a, the Fifty reason Shades why of Andy. <laughs> <laughs> and if you if your heart can take it after the first three, you win a free bowl of soup. Yeah, it's 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 kind of a, a, a weird thing. It's 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 I think it's weird in that it's so plain in what the concept is, um, because I mean, the, the, that was the problem with the, the second novel was I really was trying to be I'm going to try to blow people's minds right. and have the most out there concept. And I could see that. Yeah, but you didn't story that. That's great. That's like in anything you do that's creative, I think. 
there's the, it's like Olympic skating where there's the compulsory part of the mm -hmm. judging and then there's the freestyle part of the competition. Mm -hmm. And the freestyle, I was getting maybe eights or nines out of 10 on the freestyle portion, but in terms of beginning, middle, and limited cast of characters, and each character has something to do, and you know what each of these characters want, and you're actively actively interested in the story, that's the point which I was trying to do the triple lutz and landing on my buttons, getting into the <laughs> into, into the boards. <laughs> but at least you leapt. At least you but at least left. I left. It's, you know, that, that, that's why you, you really shouldn't worry about how good a piece is. It's 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 really cool just to get to the end of a story and know yeah. that you, you did it. And also, all writing is rewriting, especially with noveling. So, you know. Well, and I think people would assume, oh, Andy Anako, he's going to write sci-fi. Um, so I like now the other thing I would think, and you could tell me if I'm off base or you don't want to talk about it. But you're very funny, and I would think that anything you would write would have a a good measure of humor in it. Yeah, it's there's there's certainly a lot of that too. Um, I, I tried to take the example, though, of uh, you know, of Monty Python, of P.G. Woodhouse, uh, where you really have to have a you you can. It's fun to have a lot of glitter and a lot of jokes in there, but jokes that don't have that sort of structure of a story behind it. You still have to have a character that you're interested in what they want. You're interested in what they're willing to do in order to get there. And you're sort of invested in what they want to do when they get there. I mean, uh I've always, it's, uh, people sometimes ask me my favorite, they know I'm a big fan of Douglas Adams, and, you know, actually, I, uh, it's kind of odd, but I do think that the Dirk Gently novels are more satisfying than the Hitchhiker's Guidebooks, because the Hitchhiker's Guidebooks, they're funny, they're consistently exciting, but at the end, I don't know who any of these characters are, whereas Dirk Gently is someone you really want to know what they're up to next, what he's up to next. Right, right. And yeah, boy, I tell you, with somebody like Douglas Adams out there, it, or who used to be out there. He's no longer out there, but uh, it, it's a little intimidating. You don't really want to write another Douglas Adams novel. That's well, been done yeah, I mean, very well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but it's, but it's, but it's great when you see examples like that. It's great when you see how difficult Douglas Adams was in finishing the books that he was supposed True. to be doing. True. Um, and there's a, and PG Woodhouse is absolutely the king. He lived to be 97 and he wrote nearly one, excuse me, a little bit over a hundred novels in his lifetime. Uh, and there's a wonderful book that's out of print uh, called Performing Flea. That's all about correspondence between him and this uh, child friend of his from from his school days, who also became a novelist. And it's just nothing but him and the, him and his friend talking about structure and talking about how difficult it is to write novels and talking about cricket matches at the old school <laughs> and that sort of stuff. But when you see that, here's how much uh, P.G. Woodhouse's novels they just seem so effortless. Uh, but then you get to see here's how hard he worked to make sure that every scene in that book was sharp and to make sure that every character was there for a reason. And he realized that, great, it wasn't just a genius who had just vomited this brilliance right. onto, onto onion skin. He just worked and worked and worked until this thing that was not to his satisfaction was actually to his satisfaction. Would you would you like pursuing a, a career as a novelist if, if all goes well? Oh, yeah. Um, you like I writing? Mean, I, I, I just enjoy writing. Uh, and... Um, there uh, and I would be very very pleased if when if I finished this novel I thought it was good and I put it out there and it got and, and it got an audience if it sold one thousand copies just to establish that okay it wasn't just people who follow my Twitter stream who right. are again go, referring back to these people where if it, you know <laughs> Dale Earnhardt Jr. wrote a novel that would actually that would that would sell it wouldn't be a very good novel but hey it's Dale I wonder what Dale Earnhardt Jr. would would be uh, what a novel from him would be like that would be good. If it actually turned into a career, that would be even better because, again, that uh, that that pays money, and I do like money. I have a use for money. Uh, but you yeah, always, I mean, it's funny because I get the impression, boy, Andy is so poor. He's always talking about how hard it is, and the, you know, the ink-stained wretch, the life of the freelance journalist. And yet, we send you checks that you never cash. <laughs> I do. I do. Well, see, again, I think I think it's just based on that same like one ahead envelope opening thing. Where it's like as a, you're one as, ahead. A as, a, as a freelancer, it's good to know that I still have like a month or two worth of pay Some that of I have drawer. not. That, that's that's no, it's not that I don't no, I don't you know, set fire. I, it's not it's not like I'm over here saying that. I wish I, I thought I'm over here saying that, you know what, I here I, I really, I'm only doing it because I love the artwork. I, tell, I don't want to taint this experience by actually depositing a check. I keep waiting for you to do that, but no. No, no, no. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's just, there's, given that it's been a number of years since I've had, like, 
one of those jobs where all you have to do is show up on time and not smoke in the building and you will eventually get a check. Uh, it's like I like knowing that, you know, whether, whether whatever the status of my savings, no matter what the status of my checking account, there is another check that's on the refrigerator <laughs> waiting to waiting to be deposited. I do admire you, though, because the, the life of a freelancer is can be nerve wracking and, and difficult. I mean, you're on your own. Yeah, it's um, it's it's funny though. I mean, you get used to the temperature of whatever water like you spend any time in. Uh, I, I I get terrified by the pro when I uh, my my friends and family members who they have this one job, and if anything were to happen to one I guess that that's one scary job, too, isn't they it? have no they have no <laughs> income no <job>. whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Whereas, I mean, I, I like the fact that I have several employers. I love the fact that if I get sick and tired of this one job I'm doing, right. that's great. I can put that aside for a day and do this other job. Right. And that if you know, if any, a, a lot of people would have to go out of business simultaneously for me to have one of those, oh dear, I wonder if UPS is hiring moments. <laughs> I still, to this day, if I go buy a McDonald's, I worked my first job as a teenager was at McDonald's. If I go to buy a McDonald's with a help wanted sign, I make a mental note of it. <laughs> I still do that. It's just a habit. Oh, well, that's good. They're, st they're hiring. I'll keep that in mind in case this whole twit thing doesn't work out. <laughs> you have that on your CV. I <laughs> I know how to flip a burger. <laughs> so one thing that we, you know, you're unusual in um, in your field in that most of us who are in the tech field, uh, some more than others, are are like, we kind of live in public. I think of Scoble and Jeff Jarvis and me. You know everything about us. And we know so little about you, Andy. Is that intentional or are you just self-deprecating? What is, what's the deal? Um... Honestly, I, th I think it's re it's a little of both. I mean, it's it's re it's realistic in that nobody should really care. Uh, no, no one should really care about uh, most of my life. Uh, it's not interesting. It's not relevant to their interests. Um, when I write about something that's related to my private life, like what I did, like over the weekend or experience that I went through. I really don't want to do that unless it's a way that uh, it's written with a certain perspective. And I think the reader will figure out something about life in general or about that experience in general. Uh, I don't I, I've, I often see blogs written by other people that they really just want us to know how they felt every moment of every day. <laughs> and, if that, and if that works for them and if their audience likes that, that's fine, too. I'm not begrudging them. But I'm like, oh, dear, you got to give people an opportunity to miss you a little bit. Uh, and, and, and a lot of it is, uh, just a reasonable, uh, desire for privacy, uh, that, uh, I think, I, I think that once you start putting your entire life out there, it's almost like a way that you're trying to monetize every aspect of your life and every aspect of your personality. And I think that kind of leads to, a, it'll catch up to you at some point, uh, and you'll kind of wonder if you gave that stuff away cheaply. Uh, it's, it is, again, I'm not judging anybody else, but there are some things that I find very, very odd. Like when I'm reading, I'm, I'm reading a Twitter stream and I'm seeing a conversation that really should be private. Yeah. That it's like, and it's not even just like, Hey, you know, I, I, it looks like I'm over that flu because I just came out of the bathroom and here's, Oh no, 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 don't tell me about that. I don't care. <laughs> but, it's, but it's, but it's also about, you know, you're, a sister is talking to a brother and they're talking about their plans for the weekend. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, you realize that I, mean, I know that you only have about like 800 to a thousand followers, but now all of them know about your plans for the weekend. And do you realize that? And is that really what you wanted to happen? And I feel a little creepy for, you know, seeing that it's, yeah. You're not the narcissist that most of us are. Uh, I'm a narcissist in private. <laughs> it's like, I, 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 I'm, I'm alone in my house, and I'm the most important person in that house, and that pleases me greatly. But, I, but when I step out of that house, I try to realize that not everybody is going to be fascinated by your story about how you found the, the ultimate tangerine at the, at the market yesterday. I love that. I think that should be the title of your, ne of your memoir. The ultimate tangerine. No, the narcissist in private. Ah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, so I won't ask you about your love life. Uh, uh, I know I know that your mom, uh, she recently passed away a couple of years ago, right? About five years ago. Yeah. yeah, and I remember that you took care of her. You moved to be near her and all of that. <laughs> That's about all I know about you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, and, and even that was, it was, 
Uh, private. I know. I shouldn't have said a no, word. No, 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 I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Because no, because I was I was certainly mentioning it uh, on Twitter. I was certainly it was a big part of your it. life at the time. Yeah. I'm well, sure. also yeah. because you know when when I was. Uh, 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 living with my mom and taking care of her, of course, like that one, that two hours, those two hours when I was doing Mac break, you know, mom was in the next room and right. sometimes I have to get up. And so it's kind of hard to explain. Here's right. why, right. you know, suddenly I'm in this, uh, I'm in this other place. Uh, but see, but uh, yeah, again, I, I hope I don't miss the mark. It's, it's just that as I, as I say, uh, there's a, there's a degree to which I don't want people to think that I think that my life is quite that important. Um, and when I, when I did talk about that sort of stuff on the air, uh, I realize that there are a lot of people who are in that sort of position uh, and they don't know what to do. They don't know if they're going to get through it. And sometimes if you deliver that sort of example, not saying this, not uh, not saying, hi, I'm an authority on this, but simply saying, here is what my exactly. experience was. And you're probably going to find some familiarity. Uh, and I did when, when I, I delivered my mom's eulogy, I did post that uh, to my blog mm -hmm. Because I just wanted the world to know what an awesome mom my mom was, and she—it was her request that I deliver her eulogy, as I, as I, you know, the stuff that I put in the blog, uh, and I felt as though it would please her to have that uh, on my blog, in addition to uh, sharing it with the hundred or so people who are in the church. Yeah, hard thing to do to read uh, your mom's eulogy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it it, it is harsh. Uh, the 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 lesson from there that uh, I hope that I get opportunity to share with other people is that. Um, you are going to, as you as you watch your parents get older, you're going to start to wonder what's going to happen when they need someone to take care of them. Are you going to be able to step up? Are you going to be able to do what needs to be done? Uh, and the fact of the matter is, is that if you have that kind of relationship with your parents, and I'm not, uh, be presumptuous for me to suggest that everybody has that kind of relationship with their parents, at the, when the time comes, you just start focusing on, nope, this person needs me and here's what I'm able to do in order to help. Uh, and so you just get through it day by day and know that uh, it's it's a great opportunity to have a chance to repay some of the love that this yeah. person gave you during your childhood when you were yeah. in need of uh, of assistance day to day. That's what family means. Do you have uh, sisters, brothers or sisters? Uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a bunch of siblings that live mostly in New England. Oh, so you're, they're around? Yeah, it was, it was, it was, uh, uh, we were very, very fortunate in that uh, we were able to sort of uh, divvy up a lot of these responsibilities uh, into really uh, fiefdoms, so to speak. Okay. Uh, and that so, helps. yeah, yeah. And given that you know, I don't have kids, and I've I have a job where I can try. You know, there, I was going to take a financial hit for for that t amount of time, but I could still do some of my right. work, even though I was you know a wall, a wall away from my mom. Uh, that was I was certainly the best candidate to do that sort of stuff. Nephews and nieces, uh, many and brilliant. Ah. <laughs> See, you never talk about them. I bet you. Uh, well, see, uh, I bet you. You get. You're a perfect this, uncle. This is. This is. This is actually. I mean, this is actually an interesting topic of conversation, because part of part of that is that, um, I don't feel as though I have a right to. Right. I have a right to uh, take a picture of my breakfast and post it on Twitter. As much as it annoys people, sometimes the <laughs> breakfast is just so beautiful. You just want to share it with people. Your diner it's, pictures are. Uh, this make me very hungry. I just want to say. That, that's what they're. That's what they're intended. For. Uh, it's anything I can do to support the independent dining industry and convince people to look for something an independently owned diner instead of going to Denny's. Yay! Uh, I feel as though that was that was very valuable posting. Uh, but it, it's I, it's I'm within my rights I think to share that part of my life with the public. When I uh, I, I when I uh, choose to uh, proud as heck of of uh, uh, my uh, my niece's play. I was I loved to I, I was I loved being there. I was of course the embarrassing uncle with the pan with a long lens who's taking click 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 click. I was suspiciously silent when silent when anybody else was on the stage. But who cares? Uh, but I, but I feel like you know that's my sister's moment. Yes. That's my niece's moment, and I'm thrilled to give them the pictures that I took. And if they want to post them, that's fine too. If they want to talk about it, that's fine too. But I feel like it's it's always I feel like it's a, the safety you have to play is that is this person going to be bothered by that? And it, just the fact that you make sure that they have that level of control, I think, is the most important thing. This is one of the things I really enjoy about you, uh, Andy, and, and really respect about you. You, no matter what we talk about, you often seem to have thought more deeply about it than I have, and, and, and I always have something uh, that's a little bit beyond just the surface, the obvious, to say about it. It's why you're so great on Mac Break Weekly, uh, is, is kind of this, this depth of your thought. 
I think, well, I, th I think part of it is because I don't want to. Because you're alone a lot and you spend a lot of time I, thinking about it. You know, you know, I, 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 I will absolutely admit to that. Uh, I, I love, um, uh, it's some, some of the best, uh, my best thinking time comes when I'm like, I'm, I'm an hour away from someplace. I just have an hour to drive. And sometimes I will have like little arguments uh, inside the car, not with the, not with an invisible friend or talk or Wilson volleyball in the, in the other seat. But it's like that's a time to really think about I'm going to make a statement and then I'm going to try to challenge that statement. I'm going to challenge, I'm going to defend my original statement and then say, well, okay, maybe you have a point about this part that you put on, that you put onto it. Uh, and and part of it is just I don't want to be a, I don't want to be an idiot. Right. Uh, it's, right. It's it's. It's uh, most of us I, don't I, mind being. <laughs> <laughs> well, most of us don't have to fill like eight hours worth of air. That's every true. Day. I have an excuse. <laughs> it's like I, I you know, when, when I do uh, when I do like a, a TV. Uh, man, I, I've I've never been more impressed. I never really started being so impressed with the talent that you see, like on the weekend on the morning newscast or whatever. Uh, than when you are on that set and you know that this is something that you prepared a, a segment that I prepared maybe three or four days for. This is someone that this person had maybe four minutes this morning to look over a briefing paper, and they got it. Yeah, and they can yeah. be alert and ask the right questions and make sure they don't look foolish. Uh, it's uh, there, if, if there were a book of uh, simple, dumb advice that people should take, or that I, I, I wish I'd given myself earlier in life, it's that it's okay to take three seconds and think before you say something. It's okay to dump something through a preprocessor for a little sweetening before you put it into the vocal output, to, uh, output, output buffer. Right. Do you talk to yourself? Uh, who else will? <laughs> who else is going to stand up with an ego as big as mine? Uh, <laughs> and on the other hand, you say, no. Mr. No, Anatko. It's, it's... <laughs> no, I, I, and I think of the long-form pieces that you write for the Chicago Sun-Times, the, the three-parter you just wrote about why you switched phones. It's always much more thoughtful than the, 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 the stuff that you normally see uh, online, which is generally, you know, cranking it out every day, and it's not, you know, it's not really uh, thoughtful. You take the time to kind of think about it and say, well, this is why I did this. This is why I think this is important. I think that's great. It's, it's unique. Um, another thing that's unusual about you, unwilling to share your personal details, and uh, you think about things. You don't, you don't belong on the Internet at all, Andy. <laughs> well, the Internet seems to agree with you there. Uh, you, you know, you're well, a great photographer. I have to say I love your – is that a hobby for you? Is that something you take seriously? Oh, uh, abs absolutely. Um, I, I don't know if I'm any really uh, very good or not, but it's such a fun thing to be uh, to be at an event and to be trying to find that one right picture. Uh, I was at the PAX East, you know, the gaming convention mm -hmm. here in Boston, uh, and man, it's uh, one of the great th one of the great things about these compact system cameras is that I can now have like the, the the camera and three lenses and everything without looking like I'm a field reporter in, in Hanoi in 19, 1971. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I was I was excited because I've got the long zoom because I'm I'm at Bill Amend Bill Amend's uh, Q and A panel. I want to get a good portrait of Bill Amend, even though I'm seated like uh, 13 rows back and there's not much light here and there are people in costume and I want to make I I love taking pictures pictures of people in costume because that's almost you're you're 70 percent of the way towards an awesome picture because this person just looks awesome. But it's also the challenge of uh, you have probably I probably have five seconds, maybe 10 to make all the decisions I need to make in order to take two and probably exactly two snaps uh, so that if I want to say I want you to stand like sort of three quarters to me, I want you to turn your face towards that wall, but turn your eyes towards me. And if you could sort of like puff your hood, your hood out a little bit as though you're sort of peeking out, that'd be great, too. Uh, and you get home and you're like, oh, Ooh, that's about 70% of a good picture. And then you spend more time in Photoshop and screwing around with things. Uh, I, I just, I just love that aspect of it. Uh, it's there's, uh, I, I, I very much love the fact that thanks to digital, I can take a hundred photos and wind up with three that are actually good enough to keep, let alone put on Flickr. Uh, but at the end of the game, when you came away from uh, an event with two pictures that you think are really, really very, very pretty and interesting enough to share, uh, that's a really great point of pride. Here's one from, uh, Packs. Yeah, that see that that's a case in point, because there was a there were a lot of problems with that shot, uh, and so it's uh, um, it's odd that I'm going to a gaming convention because I don't really play those sort of games that take days and days and days to play, and while I was mousing around with this, I realized that well this is my version of, of video gaming, 
uh, because I, you know, I, I opened it in Aperture, made a few tweaks, and put put it on Flickr. Meanwhile, the window is still open. I look at it, say, oh, I should really get rid of that. There's an <laughs> aluminum bar like behind them. I should like Photoshop that out. I'm thinking, oh, there's sort of a color cast <laughs> over here. I should probably remove that color cast. It's not as though I'm spending nine hours on this picture, but it's just that, you know, I, I finished something. I finished writing something. I'm taking about a 45 minute break instead of like picking up an Xbox controller. I'm like clicking into Photoshop and thinking. I really think if I put a little bit extra green, I know it's a little artificial, but if I put a little extra, extra green in his eye, that would actually look a little bit better. And then 20 minutes later, I've, I've uploaded the, the 13th revision of this thing to Flickr, uh, and I'm back on to the next thing I'm supposed to be doing, but it's like, okay, that's a, that's a fun little game to play. Uh, Andy's uh, Flickr uh, site is uh, Andy Eye. His Flickr handle is Andy Eye. By the way, I love this one of the of the uh, keyboards going down I, along. I like that too, but see, yeah. we, we, get, we get back into privacy because sometimes I worry right. that... Um, because I, I promise you there was nothing nothing particular about that girl that was in the mid-ground uh, that made me take that picture. I was looking for that shot of a line going all the way into infinity of hands on keyboards. She, If it were a guy, if it were anybody else, and if she and he or she happened to be turned with their face so that you could actually see part of their face, uh, it would have been the same picture. But there's a part of me that thinks, okay, is she going to be pleased or upset right. that a picture of her wound up on the internet, more so that this creepy guy took a picture that <laughs> included her without uh, without her knowledge? And there's a, it's it's such a complicated issue because there, 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 uh, there are times when I have had to talk to somebody uh, that I've just taken a picture of and said, are you serious? Are you really complaining? I was at the, this was at the, the Boston Comic Con last year. I remember this so clearly. And so I'm trying to make sure that I get enough pictures I can tell the whole story. And part of it is here is the line of people that were waiting at 9 a.m. to get in for this t show that started at 10. And so it was just like people like lined up on a sidewalk and just do basically here's a widescreen view of, you know, 500 people in line. And then so I took the snapshot. And then as I'm entering, because I've got I've got a press pass. First of the headline saying, excuse me, I, I didn't give you permission to take my picture. Mm -hmm. And I and I and I don't want I don't want a picture of anybody that does not want their picture taken. So I said, oh, okay, I'll, I'll delete it. Said, well, you can delete it, but you already took the picture. At which point, I sort of had to like say, sir, you're on a sidewalk as part of 500 <laughs> people. I wasn't taking your picture. If you if you thought that you had an expectation of privacy sitting on a sidewalk at a huge public event, I don't know what to tell you, sir. That that said, when I used that picture, uh, it put on Flickr. Of course, I cropped him out because again, I don't want someone right. in that picture to not want the shot in there. But it's something that I, I was a it was something that I, I find fascinating that there are people who go way beyond that, that if you are in anywhere in public, they will cite you the chapter and verse of, of law that says, it's here, you're, you're, on a, you're on a public sidewalk, you have no reasonable expectation of privacy, and so I'm entitled to take this picture as so long as I don't use it for commercial use. And I'm like, dude, you basically put your camera two feet away from this guy's face without asking and took his picture because you thought that he had an interesting face. You know, do you think that maybe he would have been upset at that? Maybe you could have asked first? No, no, I got the legal right. I don't care that you would have the legal right. It's not a nice thing to do. You're such a nice guy. I mean, I, I think the people who do street photography, one of the things that they get over is, is caring about whether they're annoying people. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and you're just a nice guy. I just, I don't know. You I still I, get I, great I, pictures. I love this cat. Did the cat give you permission? Uh, the, the the cat's a cat. He's not aware of anything that anybody, any humans do. We are just simply like nitrogen atoms in the air. <laughs> We're servants. We're their yes. servants. And of course, your Holsteins, which have made them all over the world. Yes. Yeah. Um, co uh, the other thing I know about Andy Nako loves comic books. Is that a childhood uh, obsession or is something you came to later? Um, Late-ish. Maybe when I was 12 or 13, maybe. Uh, and uh, there was sort of a there was sort of a, an arc to that where I was really into comics until I was in my mid 20s. And then there started that sort of slow fade uh, that uh, was kind of, it was it was kind of weird that I had to sort of dissect my own hobby uh, in a certain way where week after week after week, I would be coming back, coming back from the comic book shop with like, you know, a dozen comics or so realized that, oh, man, I didn't like that. Then read the next one. Oh, man, I really didn't like that. So then another one say, oh, man, this, that was this, I've read that story a million times before. Didn't do anything interesting. It was disappointing. It was poorly drawn. But you when you have bought comics every Wednesday since you were 12 or 13 or for the past you know 10 or 15 years, you forget that not buying comics is actually an option. Uh, and so... 
I, 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 I'm, I'm serious. It became it came like a, a slow transition from I'm going to start to not buy comics that annoy me, which also frees me from the obligation of telling people how much a certain comic I didn't enjoy annoyed me. Uh, the, the, the big breakthrough was when, you know what? I've had this comic for three months. I've read it a few times. Now I'm going to throw it away wow. or give it away. I'm not going to save it. Wow. Like, Ooh, exactly. It's like I, I, I don't. I don't save. You I didn't rebel. save old copies of People magazine. Why was I saving old comics that are? You know, it wasn't. It wasn't like here. This one is. This one is personally signed by Jesus Christ Himself and group edited by two apostles. So it's going to be worth money someday. It's like no, you're just putting them in boxes and never opening that box ever again. Perhaps you could do something better with that space and with your time. I want to get back to comics in a second, but I just came across a photo that you obviously re-uploaded to your uh, photo stream of the eight foot bride of Harvard Square, who we now know was Amanda Palmer. Mm -hmm. And uh, do, do you know Amanda? I think you do. No. You uh, uh, um, we, uh, uh, this was a photo I took in 1999. Uh, I blogged about it at the time and, to my surprise, got an email because saying that, wow, I, you know, this is, I, I'm not really a fan of living statues, but she really, put a, she really turned it into a performance and something interesting. And about a month and a half, uh, later, I got an email from her saying, "Hi, I'm the I'm that eight foot bride. Thank you so much for for saying those nice things about me." And that was really the only time we've ever been in contact. She used this uh, image in her uh, TED talk. You know, you get yeah, photo exactly. credit in the TED talk. Yeah, it was uh, Miss. <laughs> uh, included my credited me very nicely twice. Uh, once the name was misspelled at the end credits, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, that that was yeah, but that wasn't. Uh, she approached me about using this photo. She. Uh, through Neil Gaiman's blog, uh, there was a, oh, she's looking for photos of, if you have photos of her in performance uh, at any event, she's using that as part of her talk. Right. And I thought, hey, I've got a picture of this person in 1999. There are probably not many photos of her from 1999. I bet this would be handy to her. Uh, so sent, I sent her the, uh, or rather I sent her assistant or the email address that was provided. Here is the link to the Flickr page. Which was f f fun because through the assistant, I learned that no, she does. She does want to use that. Do you have like a better, higher resolution version of it? And this was like a two, from a two megapixel camera, and that was back when all editing was destructive editing, and you didn't really care about preserving the entire film roll. And so when I had some time a few days later, it was fun to go through, dig out all of my archive uh, hard drives. Wow. And go through iPhoto libraries, and man, was I pleased when I found the original from the camera. Uh, and then the second step from that was that, so now I have the original, uh, what the what the camera spit out, and it looks horrible. And the version that I had posted to Flickr was heavily edited, as good as you can get with iPhoto, like 1.1 or whatever. Uh, and so, but now I have Aperture, which has so many more controls to it. And I can also throw it into Photoshop. And man, was I surprised and pleased with the amount of detail that was in that picture that was absolutely buried and unrecoverable by the photo tools of 1999, 2000, uh, because it's actually quite a credible photo. There's a lot it of work going into that one. Yeah. That, that's why I entitled that one when I posted it to Flickr, reposted it, that this is the remastered edition. Right. And uh, I don't know, for some reason, you seem like you could have been a Dresden Dolls fan, but maybe not. Actually, yeah. Uh, there was it seems <laughs> like your kind of music. I don't know why. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, uh, there was a... We all have our like favorite music uh, playlists. Uh, uh, there's a one song of theirs uh, called "Good Day" that I absolutely love, That's and I had I, it was I had a really nice moment. I think it was like two years ago, maybe, where I, I'm I'm working, I'm <coughs> working on email, and this song comes up on repeat play. And this was before Amanda Palmer really came back as a solo act, or at least I wasn't really aware of it. And I said, "Gee, I wonder what happened to the Dresden Dolls." Then, of course, you get distracted with. Google searches for 20 minutes. Uh, and then, okay, okay, so they they now Amanda Palmer's doing it. Okay, now here's a piece about Amanda, Amanda Palmer. That's interesting. Like, oh, she was an eight-foot bride in Harvard Square. Like, huh. Wait a you minute. No, I have a picture of an eight-foot bride. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> How many eight-foot brides could there be? Exactly. <laughs> have, I, have I unknowingly been a fan of this person that I took a photo of in 1999? I love <laughs> music? it. I love so, it. Like, sometimes sometimes this, this, this internet thing, it, it will creep you out a little bit. <laughs> Beatmaster in our chat room. Asks me to ask you about the big edit, your philosophy to get rid of things. Oh, yeah, that's it's it's something that I have to do. I, I believe that about once a year, you have to really get all your stuff together and throw out any really 
put your hands on everything you own and try to decide whether or not you want to keep it or not. Uh, and if I turn the camera around and you saw the rest of this room. Oh, go ahead. Let's see it. Come on. Come on. Not happening. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's like, uh, uh, there was I, I I don't necessarily I don't do a really big one every year, but every few years it really becomes a I'm going to go through every closet, I'm going to go through my storage unit, I'm going to go through every room in the house, and just uh, there's uh, I, I refer to my storage unit as it's sort of like the, the the classic version of the Mac trash can, where I can if I put something in the storage unit I'm throwing it away, but I can still open it up and take it back again. Uh, and it's always amazing when you go back and you dig to the very, very back of it and you realize here is a book that was the most important thing in the world to you in 2002 when you put it in a box and put it in here. And now you just couldn't care less what happens to this thing. And so sometimes it takes a while for the perfume of, uh, of, of, uh, of covetousness on a certain object to sort of like clear itself from the room so you can actually get rid of stuff. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I am a clutter guy, unfortunately. I'm not, I, I love, I, I, I'm so grateful to all these uh, hoarders shows uh, that are on cable because I watch this episode and like the episode ends, I turn the TV off and I say to myself, self, you have a problem with clutter. <laughs> Fortunately, you have never wanted to save plastic bags just because to have plastic, just plastic bags. You have never like you've never shouted at somebody that no, no, I know that I know that that plate is covered with cat poop, but I can clean the poop off. <laughs> you know, those people have an organic problem. You simply have an organizational problem that you can. I think today, because the recycling day, the, 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 the recycling depot was open. Perhaps tomorrow, perhaps tonight, you should find another couple of trash bags worth of stuff that you can feel as though you can get rid of. And it's like, oh, you, you, your heart goes out to people who really do have that yeah. sort of organic disorder where, you know, I've got, you know, what do I have, what do I have here? Here's a, like, here's a, uh, uh, just on the floor, here's a micro USB hub <laughs> that maybe I've got a bunch of these. And like, if I, if, oh, okay, this is, this one, this one, this does not free up many oxygen molecules in my office if I were to throw it away. But, you know, I would not have much of a problem in getting rid of this. I don't, I don't have an emotional attachment to it. But it's like, there are people who are like, no, I know I don't have the power supply to that. And it uses a style of USB connector that I can't find the cable for, but maybe someday I'll find that cable. And you're so grateful that whatever problems you have in life, you don't have problems that require medical attention and medication. Because that's indeed, very sad. Indeed, indeed. So uh, tell us something we don't know about you. That th so, you don't have to be too revealing, but just, <laughs> in fact, there's probably a lot of things you could tell us we don't know about you. Uh, let's see. I'm, try I'm, I'm trying to think of something that would be even remotely interesting. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, everything we, that's good. Everything we don't know about Andy is boring anyway, so don't, don't ask. <laughs> don't worry about it. Oh, geez. Maybe, maybe that uh, I, I, I lettered in swimming in, my, uh, in high school. There you go. Wouldn't have and thought that. that. Be you know, honest I, with you. I do have my letterman jacket up there. I disappointed the heck out of the coach when I said that, no, I was not coming back for a second year. <laughs> uh, I, I, I promise you, I, I, I swam like long, the, 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 the long uh, swims. And because it was not a, not a, 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 a thing that the team was competitive with in any way. So it was okay for me to lose it by three minutes to everybody else in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> so it was so I mean the, the good news was that by the end of the season I had gone from finishing about a minute <laughs> behind everybody else to finishing a con a consistent 10 seconds or 15 seconds behind everybody else that was fine uh but the it was also significant because man two weeks in I just hated that so much <laughs> and because it was so boring it's just nothing but every day after school you're just slam, doing laps slam, and laps slam. and laps and yeah. laps and it's like oh, I have so much things I would much rather, rather be doing this you know, for the, with the, this semester than doing this. But I did decide that okay, I feel as though I did I did join the swim team. I have to I can't quit. I have to see this through to the end of you know, to the end of the season. And so I saw it through the end of the season. Then told myself you don't have to do this again. You can go you can go back to typing <laughs> after school, which is which is something that is just as calisthenic. You're and you're more successful at. You have such a um, a strong. Um, moral foundation. Are you a, a deeply religious person? I wouldn't say so. Um, I identify as agnostic. Uh, I believe that the questions of religion are more interesting than the answers are going to be. 
Um, I went through a thing uh, a few years ago where I tried to, after, after identifying as agnostic for so long, asking myself, well, are you really an atheist, but you don't have the courage to go out and say, you know, you were raised with a certain religion and you're turning back on this and saying that, yes, I'm an atheist. Or by the same coin, are you scared because you work in such a, a technical sort of field and so many of your friends are scientists and uh, uh, and uh, uh, so many people are are, uh, are skeptics. Are you afraid to say, no, I do believe in God? And I went through a, a lovely period where I was just sort of trying to get as much information as I could and talk to as, getting as many opinions as I could. And I really came back to the fact that no answer that I saw, including the answer there is no God, was as interesting or as nourishing to me as the question of what do you believe and why do you believe that? Mm -hmm. Um, and as, as opposed to uh, in parts of being a moral human being, it's just easier <laughs> than being amoral, uh, or immoral. Uh, I just, I, tr uh, I try to make sure that I'm an okay guy to hang out with. I try to make sure that, you know, uh, if you hang out with me, you may like it, you may not like it, but at least you didn't think that I was being an insensitive jerk. Yeah. But yeah. the problem is the problem with insensitivity is that by by its nature <laughs> you, don't you, know, you don't know you don't know you just said something stupid and insensitive. Right. It's it's That's my it, excuse it, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it it is it is interesting, isn't it? Because there, there's so, there's so many of these simple things that you need to pick up as you go through life. One of them that I, that I've been uh, I've been reminding myself of, like you know, as I stop being a young man and start being a not an old man, but at least a not young man anymore, was realizing that you know. I know that when someone says something to you, you had an idea for a joke or something sarcastic, you do have the option of not making that sarcastic comment. Uh, there was a, 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 it came up, as a matter of fact, a week or two ago where someone was uh, an, at, at the table said that, hey, their kid's going into journalism. Uh, and of course, the, the joke is that, oh, well, I hope you hope you also take up rock music so you'll have something, something reliable and, and, and <laughs> profitable to fall back on. But, you know, it, it then stopped myself before I said it and said, you know, that's good. That's great because this is a great time. You can go on Tumblr and become a journalist and all you have to do is write well uh, and be good at what you do. And you'll find some you'll find an audience for that stuff. I really hope that things work out great for you. And it's like, OK, that was a more that was a more thoughtful thing to say. <laughs> I'm wow. glad I wasn't a jackass during you're, that. <laughs> you're good because I go for the joke every single time yeah, I know, and I deeply it's, regret it almost it's every right single there. time. I know it's right there. It's right yeah. there. <laughs> There's a big red button that you just slap that and boom. All right. I'll give you a, I'll give you a tidbit. Nobody knows about Andy Anako. He invented the Macquarium. Is that true? Uh. I don't think I invented it. Um, there was, there was, because uh, I, I certainly didn't. Because I think the first Mac World Expo I went to in 1985, saw one. I saw it's, it's. You have a Mac Classic Mac. It looks a little bit like a boxy aquarium. Uh, people will naturally try to do it. As a matter of fact, I think that there's a. After I started writing about this sort of stuff, someone sent me a tech note. That was I'm not I don't know if necessarily if it made it outside of Apple, but someone inside Apple had figured out a way to do it. Uh, but it was such a complicated sort of structure glass structure you had to build in order to fit inside this that I don't think I didn't I wasn't really tempted to try it. Um, so uh, I was doing the Q and A column uh, for a Mac user, and uh, someone this, this is when the Mac Plus was the Mac Plus and the Mac SE were like the current Macs, and someone asked, well, "What's the how can I make my Mac 512K uh, useful?" And of course, Mr. Creativity, Mr. Clever Pants, Mr. Sarcastic said, "Oh, you can turn it into an aquarium. That would make it useful." <laughs> And, and then I went on and actually answered the guy's question. Which, but, but, that, but that led to like all kinds of people writing and say, well, how do you turn a, a Mac into an aquarium? And so it was fun because I spent like a month, month and a half trying to figure out how best to do this. Not only how to make it work, but also how to reduce it to a simple set of plans that anybody could follow as opposed to this other set of plans that I'd encountered later on, which is just all these weird angles and you need to be a really good glass cutter. But nope, just go take this sheet of paper to uh, any place that cuts windows glass, window glass, have them give you these sheets of glass, put it up with silicone, make this one platform, boom, it works. Uh, so I, there, if, if I have a, a version of the resume that I'm not sure that I can really back up, uh, a line on that resume is that I, if I publish one of the first eBooks because I've, uh, no way was there, there was no such thing as a World Wide Web. There was ninety two, maybe ninety three, uh, and Mac uh, Mac user was not going to be able to like publish this like six uh, six thousand word book with illustrations inside the magazine. So I just said, look, I'm posting this into the forum on CompuServe. It's a Word file with uh, with document with uh, uh, pictures inside it. Uh, download if you want to hear all the plans, and I also put in the front of it, you know, here's the 
I'm giving this away for free, but it's not public domain. Uh, make sure if you re just put it wherever you want, just keep my uh, keep my authorship there. And uh, if you don't don't build these and sell them for profit, because you know figure that out on your own. And just if you want to thank me in any way, donate blood to the Red Cross, and uh, we'll we'll consider that even. Uh, so that's that's it's 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 very very pleasant. As a matter of fact, in one of the storage lockers, I do have still about a dozen, like maybe even a dozen and a half old Macs, uh, because there was you a time. You do. When, I was wondering. Yeah, because there's there's there was a time when people would like ask me to like donate one for like a raffle or something, right. make one, uh, or I would yeah. give one away as a gift, or I would give away the one that I had in my office and I had to make another one. Uh, and back when uh, Massachusetts started charging money to dispose of computers. <laughs> I found that the, the price of the MIT flea market on an old Mac used to go <laughs> went from like fifty dollars to ten dollars to five dollars to I have a pile of these here in the booth. Just take as many as you want because I don't want to have to pay to have these disposed. I take you back to nineteen ninety three, Doctor Mac, Bob Levitis, and a very young. Uh, it teaches you how Andy to take an absolute Anaco. Macintosh and turn it into an aquarium. I'm you got to see this. So Andy, tell us a little bit about Boy, the quality uh, terrible on this. you to create the Macquarium. Well, I'll start out in a quest for me to decrease my word count by making a joke about upgrading a 512K back in the No to mutton chops. That being the only yeah, but you do have the hat, can do to the it. fedora. Uh -huh. Of oh, course, God, I still uh, miss a torrent that shirt. of male that follows that well, how actually do you do it, which led to an eight-month odyssey of trial, error, and successes and failures. Well, we don't want to upset certain sensitive You had a little viewers, more of a Boston accent failures, back then, which, Andrew. But, you know, the ones that are in there right now, thankfully, are well, before benefiting I spent from more the time failures overseas. <laughs> <laughs> that is on YouTube if you want to see more of it, as is I see Bob Llewellyn's interview uh, with you uh, on his uh, carpool show. Yep. Um, what? Uh, one last question. Coolest thing you ever found at the MIT flea market? Uh, that would be a... <laughs> that would actually be a uh, either an alt, original Altair 8080 Ooh. or the door from an Apollo trainer. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and the door was not for sale. It was uh, this guy had actually managed to acquire from a defunct museum, like a a, a training version of the uh, or, or a test a test bed version of an Apollo uh, crew capsule. Uh, and he was trying to, of course, had been sort of gutted out, and he was trying to like find people who had parts uh, so we could restore it to like its original, I don't know, flyable condition. And it's just like, oh, it's a, uh, can I pretend to be an astronaut? Jim Lovell staring out through that window. Can you take my picture staring out through that window, sir? All I have is $130, but I can go to the ATM and get more. That's the best reason to live in Boston, the MIT flea market. And Andy and Nako. Andy, great to talk to you. Thank you for joining us today on uh, Triangulation. Always cool to chat with you, Lou. Yeah, always fun. Nice to spend some time just talking. Just talking. Yes. And is that uh, Indiana Jones behind you there? We always have to ask. Andy always has amazing backdrops. That is uh, a Jim Stranko uh, concept art painting of Indiana Jones that they uh, uh, Spielberg and Lucas actually commissioned him to come up with. So here's the basic story. Could you paint some scenes of because he was famous for those kind of like action pulp scenes. Uh, and it's actually said that the actual costume design of Indiana Jones came from this one of these Stranko wow. paintings. Wow. I didn't know it was going to be a fedora and a and a, and a right. bag and a leather jacket, but it's like, okay, that works. We'll use that. Thank you. Mr. What Stryker. is the story? Of, I, okay, I said one last question, but one more. What is the story of the fedora? Because I didn't realize you wore one as long as twenty years ago. Longer than that. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, I, I don't want that. I, I don't want that to ever become an affectation uh, because there's nothing more pathetic than. You know, when you see somebody who, like, what's what's sadder than Hulk Hogan that still has to wear the sweatband and right. like the ripped muscle T-shirt, <laughs> as opposed to, well, you're you're in your what, is he in the 60s now? It's okay if you wear a polo shirt now. You know, it's it's okay. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I have a, I'm very very grateful to one of my oldest friends uh, has uh, a picture of me like an at 17 or 18 with a hat, uh, much like my regular regular fedora. I, I wear it because I enjoy it. I wear it <laughs> in public. I will take it off when it's socially inappropriate to be wearing a hat. And there are days when I don't actually wear it. So it's not uh, it's, it's not something uh, that, I, that I have to wear all the time. It's a great hat. And a great choice. It is. It, it is. A, it is a great one. I have. Yeah. I usually have a box of like four or five of them, so that if, ah. if they ever stop making it, I have at least a two-year lead time <laughs> to, to find another hat that I like. Oh, so this is a specific brand of fedora. I found it's it's just that you find one that you like, mm -hmm. and 
it's inexpensive. It's easily orderable over the internet. So why would I go hunting for a million kinds of that, of different kinds of that? It's like I will simply buy a box of three or four of them. Uh, and it's, it's, it's kind of like when uh, 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 Charles Schultz, the cartoonist, one of my favorite stories about him is that he uh, uh, he there was a type of steel crow quill that he really liked to draw with. He thought was the perfect crow quill. When he found out that the company was going to stop making them, he simply called them and say, how many do you have in your warehouse? And he said, great, I will take them all. Uh, and so he, <laughs> he, 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 he used to, he used to like every time a new, uh, he get a new editor or something or anything at the, at the syndicate, he would like, and they, they came to visit him. He'd say, yeah, well, I'm glad you came to, to see me. I mean, I've, I kind of decided that I'm probably going to stop doing the strip as soon as I run out of uh, my, my favorite crow quill pen. And they're like, oh, my God, so Sparky's going to be uh, four months, a, a year. Then he'd laugh and show him the storage closet with tens of thousands of boxes of nibs. <laughs> when, when you find something you like and you have the ability to not have to make that decision again, why make that decision? Why again? exactly? Buy more. Thank you so much, Andy. Great to talk to you. We'll see you Tuesday on Mac Break Weekly. When is 5 by 5s uh, Nako's Almanac on? Uh, usually we record every Thursday, sometimes schedule, uh, uh, schedule interferes, but usually posts on Fridays. Good. But five by five dot TV. You can catch that as well. That's where Andy talks about all his enthusiasms, the TV <laughs> shows and movies and comic books. So that's, that, that's where, that's where you find the person who's not kind and not gentle. <laughs> and not, and another thing, hey, if Marvel he, keeps <laughs> crapping on the Fantastic Four the way they keep doing it, I don't even know what I'm going to do. Okay. Evil Come Andy. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Take care. We do triangulation every Wednesday. Hey, roughly 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern Time on Twit.tv. Do join us live. I, I like the chat room to, to help me out with questions. But if you can't, we have on-demand versions of all 96 shows now. Audio and video available at twit.tv slash TRI. We'll see you next time on Triangulation. Did I say the time wrong? 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern? Well, it's whenever we started. Well, it starts at 3.30. 3.30, <laughs> You know when. Tune in. <laughs> Just keep the window open. It doesn't cost you anything, for God's sake. <laughs> Just leave the window open. There are plenty of bits. We'll make more. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Excellent. Always a Thanks. pleasure.